Hey watercolor wizards, Hajra here. You might recall I did a bee themed piece with watercolor pencils some time ago. After that I realized that folks would probably appreciate a separate techniques video on how to use watercolor pencils. So here it is, thanks for parking your brushes here and let the epic painting adventures begin. Watercolor pencils are basically color pencils with a magical secret. They look like regular color pencils but their colors are soluble when wet for lovely watercolor effects. Choosing a brand for quality and affordability is up to you, a personal choice, and there are many kinds out there. I personally have only a set of 12 of the brand I heard the best things about, Albrecht Durer Faber-Castell watercolor pencils. These pencils are light, fast, robust, artist-grade pencils with soft leads and brilliant colors. So how many ways can I use these watercolor pencils if I get around to using them? I've discovered the following six methods. Number one, dry. This is just using your watercolor pencil incognito as a color pencil. Color with it dry on dry paper to create a conventional colored pencil drawing. The textures can be prominent with translucent dry application and more smooth looking with opaque dry pencil application burnished with a clear or white pencil. You can also use dry lines to add details to a watercolor piece that would be harder with a brush like electric power lines, ship rigging, eyelashes, small highlights, fur edges, and more. Dry lines can also be used as contour lines, hatching, cross hatching, and stippling to replace your ink marker if you use them last. Dry watercolor pencil lines are also particularly useful if you have exhausted the finish of a watercolor paper and it will no longer hold a fine wet paint line or edge. Then a fine wet paint line can be replaced with a dry fine line in watercolor pencil. Number two, dip and draw. Dip your pencil's tip in water and then draw with it on dry paper. Don't press too hard, the pencil core is very soft. The result will be a fuzzy line, but still with some spread control since the paper itself is dry. Any line that needs a fuzzy edge but doesn't spread too far is a great candidate for this method. Number three, dry then wet it. First, draw and color with your pencil dry on dry paper. Then go back over the colored areas with a brush wet with clean water. The colors will saturate and move, creating a watercolor effect. This technique reminds me of those color by numbers coloring books we saw as kids that needed a single wet water brush to release different colors in different areas. Remember to rinse between different color sections if you're not blending colors so your colors don't contaminate each other and turn to mud. Also, pressure is important here, both in the coloring and brushing stages. If you apply more pressure while coloring, more texture of the pencil will remain even after the color is wet with a brush. If you use less pressure and less textured paper, you'll get less pencil texture remaining after you wet it. Also, if you use a light hand with your paintbrush, the colors will saturate and only slide about a little. If you press hard or scrub, the color will move more or even lift. Doing this a lot will dilute the color to almost nothing for certain colors and papers. Be mindful of what you want to achieve and gauge your pencil and brush pressure accordingly. Typically, dry pencil application first will always leave some amount of pencil texture on the paper. Number four, palette paint. You see me do this a lot. I often end up using my watercolor pencils as conventional watercolor paint because I want them to leave no pencil texture behind in certain instances. Color onto your palette with your pencil or a piece of paper, though paper is more wasteful as some of the paint will be absorbed into the paper. The tip can be dipped quickly into water first if your palette is too slippery. Or flakes can be shaved off or a larger piece cut off of your pencil and put into a palette. Then use your paint from your palette with a wet paintbrush, just like you would tube or pan paint. This is a nice versatility that watercolor pencils provide. If you are traveling with them or don't want to pull other paints out, they can be used off a palette too. In larger color areas and areas that need to be smooth and texture free can be painted easily. It also makes new color mixes really easy, though this can also be done by overlapping colors on the paper, dry, or wet. Watercolor pencil paint will be waxier and with a tendency to lift a bit more than conventional watercolor paint, but good quality pencils should still glaze and layer okay. Number five, wet and wet. I love this one. It's applying a dry watercolor pencil onto wet paper, whether it's dots, lines, or larger areas of shading. The results are really saturated colors with fluffy soft edges with various levels of unpredictability. The more wet the paper is, the more spontaneously your color will bleed and spread and vice versa. The bleeds and blooms can be further encouraged to grow with more water brushed or stippled over the wet paper if it gets too dry for satisfactory effects. And especially when you're using dots, it's a lovely technique to emulate impressionist painting styles of pointillism and chromoluminarism for vibrating, optically mixed colors. Number six, pencil sanding. Rub your pencil against some sandpaper to generate fine flakes or against a razor or X-Acto blade for bigger flakes of color. I prefer shaving flakes with a blade since none of the color is wasted on the sandpaper and the flakes are just larger and more prominent. Do this over wet paper and the flakes will fall into the water and create bursts of color. Depending on how wet your paper is and how small or large your color flakes are, you will get varied color burst sizes and intensities. Color bursts are great in backgrounds, abstract pieces, or to add texture in any passage of a large 
larger painting. It's a good technique to replace salt bursts if you don't like putting salt on your paper, and it's also good to replace dye-based brush powder color bursts with light fast pigment based color bursts on your art. So even though this was last on the list, I filmed it first because I realized that pencils have to be dry for making sanding or scraping easier, so keep that in mind when you go to sand or scrape your pencils yourself. All six of the methods I've covered here can be layered for various degrees of color intensity and darker values. I did a fast and easy study of a mermaid from Disney's Peter Pan utilizing all six different watercolor pencil techniques, so keep an eye out as you watch me do those. And you can also paint along if you're a patron, since two mermaid sketches with references are available for you. Let me go ahead and mention my big takeaways as I painted this mermaid. The first thing was, this was much tougher on my hands than conventional watercolor paint. This is because I tried to make use of dry coloring and also dry than wet coloring effects for texture or fine lines, and that requires more little strokes back and forth and more strokes to build up color and more pressure applied to the pencil than using a paintbrush. A wet brush barely needs any pressure put on it, and wet color can be applied with various size brushes and it spreads and covers fluidly and much more easily, not like the more tedious pencil coloring. Though watercolor pencils can be used for any watercoloring project, I've found their small points a bit of a hassle for larger paintings, but especially useful for miniature paintings or for adding lines, dots, or other small details that might be daunting with a paintbrush. I should remember to use mine more often. Currently, I've only used them for like two projects, so I've had them for several years. Residual pencil texture can be an issue for some papers and pencil brands. These pencils were fine, they were pretty creamy, and the paper was pretty smooth, so I was able to just use textures when I wanted them. There's also a waxy resist that builds up when using watercolor pencils. It's not noticeable at all when working in light, thin glazes, but in the deepest, darkest areas of brown and blue shadows, I noticed that the resist was an issue with me applying more paint. This may not happen to you if you never get this dark in values in a piece, and I didn't have any issues with this in my past bee and flower petal pieces or wolf thumbnail paintings, which were also done in watercolor pencils but it did happen in this mermaid piece in the shadow areas. So additional glazing can be problematic as you go super dark, especially if you're applying dry pencil, you'll fight or resist on the paper. Dry details, hair, fur, fine lines are all a great use for these pencils, but I guess they don't blow me away because the dry lines look like color pencil and not like watercolor or other paint, and I'm just not a big fan of the color pencil look. I got into painting because I love the polished, unique look of it that you can't get with markers or color pencils. I know folks layer and burnish color pencils to make them look like oil or other paint, but that's too hand labor intensive for me. So I won't be buying any more watercolor pencils in the future probably. There isn't much I can do with these that I can't do with my brushes. I can apply fine lines with a spotter or any fine pointed brush. I can apply texture using the dry brush technique and I can get effects similar to color bursts from flakes by spattering or by using salt. These are expensive and take a lot of hand effort for me to use and since I have chronic pain and injury from joint hypermobility, I don't see myself getting used to that part. I'm happy with the small set of pencils I have. They are really good quality and I can use them for many miniature painting or for pointillism, they still make faster and more even dots than a brush does, I'll definitely reuse them for pointillism effects. They're also obviously super convenient for travel as they can be fine liners, used dry, and also made wet for watercolor effects. I don't think I'd travel with these expensive pencils though, I'd be afraid of losing some, but that's just me. Since I used all six different techniques, I had a lot of textures and noise. I made sure to leave the skin Disney cartoon smooth with no shadows because it was a good place for visual rest. I also used a white gel pen for highlights because I'm trying to use the few gel pens I have before they dry out, but I do have a white watercolor pencil as a stand-in for other projects once my gel pens are gone.
They were a lot of fun to use for this mermaid piece, just not planning on getting more since I think they are redundant for many paint brushing effects and they are hand draining tools for me. I think I'll stick to watercolor pans and brushes for most of my art. Well wizards, hope you enjoyed my sharing six ways to use watercolor pencils so they can be enjoyed to their fullest. Have you discovered any other ways to use watercolor pencils? Do you own any or just think they are a finicky waste for watercolor? Please like, comment, subscribe, and check out my website links and Patreon page to support my art and art channel below. Thanks for parking your brushes here and wishing you all magical watercolor pencil adventures.